All right, so here we go. This word is being spoken for each one. Mm -hmm. And if there is anyone or any place on the planet that you would like included, just think of their name or that place now and know that this word also includes them because this, this one mind is infinite. It is omnipresent. It cannot be overloaded by its own creation because this one mind is right now giving all of its intention and, and attention in creating, supporting, sustaining, and maintaining each one. And so any and all belief that God could be overwhelmed or that there is any need to not bother God with one's troubles or that one needs to only go to God when one really needs God and that one can handle all the petty little problems in the world all by oneself, all uh, separation of one's life from that which you need God for and that which you can carry all by oneself. All of that kind of thinking is all by this word erased, vanished in the realization now. There is only one life. That life is God's life. That life is perfect, whole, complete. It is infinite, it is eternal, it is cause, and it is creating and becoming and expressing itself in its creation. This one life is creating each one now. And that one life is living its life in, through, as, and all around each one now. The life that each one has been given is the life of the divine that is particularizing itself in a specific way, and that is each one. Each one is unique. There is a name, a divine name in the mind of God as it declares, I am that I am. That divine name, unique, is the name, the true name of each one. Call it one's true self but it is present. It is all that the divine is with its particularized intention for expressing all that it is in a unique way. It has created this entire universe and everything in it and peopled it with its presence. And its presence is the presence of each one. The presence of the presence is present right now, right where each one is. That's life. That is the gift of life. There is no other occupying one's space in consciousness. The allness of life is living itself right where each one is, declaring the first cause, I am that I am, so that each one may join in agreement with I am that I am, becoming that first cause to each one's relative world. And everything in each one's experience, all the facts, all the matter, all the stuff, all the emotions, all that is the effect of the first cause coupled with the first cause, that relative first cause of each one. And so each one is now valuing this gift of life, valuing it for all that it is. And any and all belief that something that occurs in the world of effects, in time and space, anything that occurs here on earth, within human beings or the human race, that somehow that whatever is going on in the world, that any belief that anything that is going on in the world can be so huge that it can overrule that divine I am that I am is realized right now to be a total and complete lie. And all belief in it and the effect of believing it is all by this word, erased, evaporated, and vanished. Each one is 
this one life of God and experiences this delight of the divine name that the divine has given to each one. Each one is aware of it. And whether he or she is aware of it or not, each one is it. There's nothing that one need to do. This divine life is living itself right now as each one. Each one accepts it and is more aware of it. And in this greater awareness of it, each one is discovering all the gifts of life that have been given, which is freedom of choice, which is all the qualities of the divine, health and vitality, which is love and connection, which is harmony and balance in relating with everything else, which is wisdom, intelligence, and divine guidance, which is prospering and thriving experience of living, which is a manifestation here in earth of moving from good to greater good in the world of conditions, seeing everything always intact, always improved, always manifesting more and more of the glory of the divine that is present. And so any belief in lack, limitation, or loss, that's something that is divine has been lost, is all by this word erased, vanished, and gone. The gift of life is given, all of it now. It is not a life that gets used up by how much time someone has been on the planet. No, the gift of life is given now, perfect, whole, and complete, intact in every way with all of the intelligence and all of the law, the powerful law, all of the loving substance, all of it present. This divine combination of essence being able to create a newborn, each one is as new now as that newborn. And any belief in history, in the past, any carrying on of the worldly past within one, it's all erased, evaporated, and vanished. Each one is fresh and new newly born and seeing and discovering his or her life brand new, fresh, filled with vitality, enthusiasm, inspiration, filled with a, a delight of a realization that there are now for each one infinite possibilities yet to be, that each one has infinite potential, that there is no lessening of the expression of life, all of that belief by the human race, in senility and aging and lost opportunities, regrets and uh, scarring, it's all erased, evaporated. There is no stamp made on the soul of God by this earth. This divine presence, I am that I am, is the life each one is living. And each one is knowing and realizing and experiencing this infinite newness now and is looking upon each one's life and claiming all of it as being present now and discovering that those false beliefs that have created an experience of missing out of of being robbed or having good taken away or delay, it's all vanished and gone. Each one is right now. Behold, I am the child of the divine, holy, loved, fully being, and all this life is the gift that each one is given. It is eternal, it is infinite, it is wonder-filled, and it is filled with limitless possibilities right now for each one. I am grateful that this is the truth. I release this word to the law, which is taking this word as the start of a new series of creation, of newness, of greater good, of refreshment and delight, vitality, of an experience for each one of an eager anticipation of all the good yet to be as well as a filled 
sense of gratitude for all that is. I am grateful that this is truth, so I let this word go to the law. It is done, and so it is. That's the way it is. All right. So we'll turn it over to Reverend Rich. Yes, they rob I, sold I to the merchant ships. Minutes after they took I, from the bottomless pit. But my hand was made strong by the hand of the Almighty. We forwarded this generation triumphantly. Won't you help to sing these songs of freedom? Oh, I never had was redemption songs, redemption songs. Emancipate yourself from mental slavery, not by ourselves can free our minds. No fear for atomic energy. The further them can stop at the time. How long shall they kill our prophets while we stand aside and look? Some say it's just a part of it. Got to fulfill the book. Won't you help to sing these songs of freedom? All I never had. Redemption songs, redemption songs. The magic joke from mental slavery, none but ourselves can free our minds. Have no fear for atomic energy. None of them can stop at the time. How long shall they kill our prophets? While we stand aside and look. The some say it's just a part of it. We've got to fulfill the book. Won't you help to sing these songs of freedom? All I never had Redemption songs Redemption songs Come on! <laughs> job people! Job people come! Yeah. I and I! I and I! I and I. <laughs> I always play it every week. Yeah. I am open. I am open. My heart is ready to receive. I am open. I am open. My heart is ready to receive. I have opening, I have opening, my heart is ready to receive. And so let's take a moment and open to what? To what? Your your choice. Choose oh, choose what you want to be open to and be really clear about it. Not to everything, because You'll get everything that you believe in with everything. <laughs> Trust me. So choose to be open to 
the higher self, the good, the better, to health. Be open to love. Be open to the fulfillment of what is in your heart. And let's know that all of this is supplied to us in abundance. And so it is. I am opening. I am opening. My heart is ready to receive. I am opening. I am opening. My heart is ready to receive only good. Only good. Only good. Good morning. We are a little bit rambunctious here today. Yes, we are. I think we're excited about having a little celebration afterwards. So those of you that may not be here, physically may come later, join us. Um, my name is Susan Mead. I'm a practitioner here. And here, what is here? We are the Center for Spiritual Living Princeton, and we are a loving, healing, inclusive community that teaches and practices the principles of the science of mind for the well-being and spiritual growth of ourselves and the world. Yes, and I got to tell you something. I'm very excited about Reverend Karen's topic today. In fact, I'm so excited. I'm going to make a recommendation to everybody. I think we should share that around the world. And then everything will be handled and, right? Right. <laughs> it's free. It's free. <laughs> the answer is free. Uh, I have a few announcements. Uh, we have a new offering coming up around the corner. A few of us had started a little writing, I don't want to say workshop, but writing time, spirit-guided writing time, where we get together on Zoom, we do a treatment, and then we go away from the Zoom window when we do our writing. So if you're writing a book or writing a play, play or a term paper or whatever you're writing, uh, we'll be announcing that. The uh, link to the Zoom call will be on our Facebook page and our website. And it's Saturday mornings at 1030 for simply an hour. So that's coming up. And this Wednesday in Evening Inspiration, by the way, it's been a year. It's been a year. Wow. And uh, we will be taking something from Deepak Chopra's The Book of Secrets. And I can't tell you what it is because it's a secret. <laughs> However, I will say that the purpose of it is to, to help us get some of this weight off our shoulders because we tend to be hard on ourselves. So this Wednesday evening, it's about that. It's about unweighting. Unwaiting. So there's that. And then the following week for July, all of, no, not, is it July yet? June. June. All of June, it will be the Temple of the Living Spirit where we will be honoring our bodies, our physical bodies, and listening to the words of Holmes and Frederick Bales. And uh, I went to a workshop with Virginia Stevenson. She's an infinite way person. And she refers to this as our spacesuit, you know. So we're going to be talking about that for June. You know, what is, what is this really? And honoring it. Uh, I know that oftentimes we have problems, right? We're talking about problems today. Uh, and we have problems. And when, when we think of our bodies, we think, oh, I'm aching. Or we don't often think, oh, my, my feet are taking me out the door. Or my hands are feeding me. Or my eyes are seeing the beautiful sights in the world. We forget, right? We seem to focus on what isn't working. So this month of June in Evening Inspiration, it's about that. And of course, I mentioned our little after party. And we have some wonderful, what kind of punch is that, Mary? Fizzy's peach punch. A fizzy peach punch. I just like saying that, fizzy peach punch. So yeah, we have some wonderful things. So. Um, so I wanted to talk about a problem. And it's so funny because when we before we started, Karen said, does everybody have a problem? Because apparently we'll be going through that maybe during the talk. But I have a problem. And it's so interesting because ever since I saw the notice that she was going to be doing this topic, I'm, I became very excited. But I started paying attention to the problem. <laughs> and just like I was talking about our physical bodies, how we seem to focus on sometimes what's not working. I was paying attention to how I was focusing on the problem. 
And in so focusing on the problem, I was noticing some other things. I was talking about the problem. I had some friends over last night. Somebody's up here, we have a big wedding to go to tomorrow, and we were all outside on the patio, and I saw it coming out of my mouth. I did. And I was so excited for that because it really made me think. And then, of course, I, I have um, pictures on my phone, and I have an album called Science of Mind. And whenever there's something really cool, I take a picture of it so that no matter where I am, if I don't have a book or something, and I just can go to a, my albums, and there's these quotes. So yesterday, this quote appeared at night after I went to bed after talking about my problem. Just going to say, I am a practitioner, but after all, practitioners have problems too. <laughs> so <laughs> I want to read this to you. And of course, Karen, Reverend Karen brilliantly brought this up, of course, in her beautiful treatment when we started, but we forget. I forget. I don't want to put it out on you guys. The law is a law of reflection. The life is a mirror reflecting to us as conditions the images of our thinking. Whatever one thinks tends to take form and become a part of his experience. And that is from page 329 in The Science of Mind. And I'm so glad I have that on my phone because it's very important. So what do you think was happening when I was talking about my problems? Well, I was enhancing my problem. I wasn't talking about not having the problem. I wasn't speaking as if the problem were dissolved or wasn't even there, I was talking about the problem. So I'm just bringing that up as just a little reminder and also to get some excitement going for this amazing, amazing talk we're about to have about handling our problems. Right? Yeah. Yes, yes, are we excited for this talk? I am excited for this talk. Anyway, thank you all for listening to me ramble about my problem. I hope that you got a little insight around it. So have a great day. See you later. And Reverend Rich. <laughs> Everywhere we are is holy ground. Everywhere. So can there be a problem on holy ground? No problem. No problem. <laughs>
Thank you, Reverend John Rich. Heron. Good morning. I'm John Heron, and I am a licensed practitioner with the Centers for Spiritual Living. And so, problems? Who's got problems? <laughs> Today seems to be talking about problems, and, and so I have a little meditation that I thought we could do together. Um, as a wonderful approach when we have the awareness of problems in our lives, which is pretty much every day as far as I'm concerned. Uh, <laughs> I mean, I could say there are, they aren't there, but my husband is sitting out there and he'd go, oh. oh. <laughs> anyway, so here's a, a, a wonderful a spiritual approach uh, to problems that um, Ernest Holmes wrote at one time. I think it's from this thing called You. Um, and so, let's start off getting, getting our hearts and minds ready for the message from Reverend Karen. Take a nice, deep breath. And if you notice any place in your body where there's tightness, just let it go. This is going to be a meditation about letting it go. And so now's a great time to allow your thoughts to focus on one of those problems that may be going on in your life right now. That thing that just won't go away, that buzzes around your head like a mosquito, that you wish wasn't there. And just for this little period, allow that to be present in your mind. And now you may want to let your outer eyes close and let your inner eye open. And let your outer ear close and your inner ear open. As we listen to the presence of the divine, which is the answer to all problems. And I'm going to read this meditation and just follow along with me. I believe that divine intelligence, which is the mind of God, is guiding, guarding, and directing my thoughts and actions. I believe that God already knows the answer to this particular problem Therefore, I am letting go of the problem, and I am listening to the answer as though it were sure. The answer to this problem exists in the mind of God and is revealed to my mind now. Something in me does know what to do. I joyfully accept its guidance. I am open to new ideas, new hopes, and new aspirations. This which so recently seemed a problem no longer exists. For the mind of God, which knows the answer, is quietly flowing through my thought and feeling. Great peace and joy come over me as I accept this answer from the giver of all Take a nice deep breath in and just know now that the answer is present and is revealing itself to your mind now. And you may find that before the end of Reverend Karen's talk today, the answer will present itself to you, maybe as a, as a thought, as a a bunch of words or maybe a feeling 
or a clarity, but this answer is present right here, right now. It is your answer from the deepest place within you. And from this place, I'll do a spiritual mind treatment. <clears throat> but this word is for each one who is now present here, either physically present or present digitally, and those who wish that they were present. And this presence is God. This presence is the one. And it is infinite blessing. In this presence there is only good. And this good is always with us. Ready. Waiting for us to open to it. And since this presence is all the presence there is, it is the presence of each one who is participating. And right here and now, I declare that each one is now knowing this presence in a deeper and fuller way than ever before. The fountain of blessing in each one's heart is open, is flowing, problems dissolve, each one is knowing that there is no problem. What there is, is the presence of infinite blessing. The thought, the idea of problems now dissolves, is dissolved. This is the truth. Each one is living a life of more joy, of more fulfillment, of more truth and more love. And in that presence, each one is fully blessed, knowing the truth. With great gratitude for this truth, I release this to the law, knowing it is already so. And so it is. Only 
solutions. Where they shake my heads and they look at me as if I've lost my mind. If I tell them there's no hurry, just sit here doing time. I'm just sitting here watching the wheels go round and round. I really love to watch it roll. No longer ride my own the merry go round. I just had to let it go. I just had to let it go. I just had to let it go. <laughs> oh, what me worried <laughs> right okay so oh good so i'm glad you're all out there uh damaris angela robert's there margit says she's on her way well we got a we got a we got a mob here we're so excited we're still socially distanced but you know there's uh Food all over the place. Hello, Alan. Good to see you there, too. Okay, I think I'm all caught up. So our talk today is about how to handle a problem. Um, I'm being inspired by Norman Vincent Peale's book, The Amazing Results of Positive Living. And um, it's mostly his chapters that I'm inspired, the titles that I'm inspired by, because then, you know, I read his stuff and I'm like, science of mind is better than this. We got better mm -hmm. options. Uh, so to get the maximum use out of today's talk, or you can come back to this talk anytime when you have a problem. So everybody come up with a problem that you have. Um, so pick one. That, that's hard, right? Because, all right. Um, yeah, there's, yeah. Years ago, I had a... Uh, a, a young woman sharing an office with me, and she told me the two different kinds of problems. There's the oops problem, which can be fixed. Like I drop something, oops, I can pick it up. And then there's the uh-oh problem, which is what we're gonna talk about today. Those things where it just can't be, like you drop it and it, is in a million smithereens, and it's not yours. Uh-oh, I got a problem. Um, Norman Vincent Peale's title is How to Handle a Difficulty. And um, early on in this teaching, I was told, or rec it was recommended to me, to not call it a problem anymore, but to call it a challenge. And it took me a while to do that. Because, uh, but, but now I realize I do, as I was sitting, thinking about what, what example of a problem can I give for this, I was really thinking, I only have one problem, and it's me. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> so I have lots of challenges out there. And it's me that makes it a problem. So uh, I want you to consider that now with whatever it is that you have uh, on your mind that you've picked. Because spiritual truth is this. If there is a question, it's because there is an answer that wants to be known. If there is a situation that seems unmovable or impassable, it is there for you to discover a different way. Spiritual truth is there is always a way, an answer, a solution. It might not be the one you like or want, or you might not want to participate in it. It might require stuff of you that you don't want any part of. But there is always an answer. There is always a solution. There is always a way out, regardless of the situation. 
Norman Vincent Peale talks about one of the factors in our ability to solve a situation, a difficulty, is our belief. And so it's very important if you don't believe this yet to start saying it to yourselves when you have a situation, to start saying to yourself, there is a way, there is a solution, there is an answer. And Norman Vincent Peale also says that one of the things that we need to have when we're facing a situation, a difficulty, whatever, is persistence is that ability to stay with it. In other words, to not to take no for an answer, but there is a way, and to keep insisting on it. He gives the example of Robert, Roger Bannister, who was the first person who ran a four minute, ran a mile under a four minute, under four minutes, right? And when asked about, you know, what, what he thought made that happen, he, he said it was belief. I think also his coach kind of tricked him in as he was running and giving him an incorrect time so that uh, when he did, uh, I guess, at the halfway mark or whatever, gave him an incorrect time. So in his mind, he was thinking, oh, oh, I can run faster than this. And so he ended up breaking that. I could be making that up, but that happened to somebody. So, <laughs> you know, so <laughs> that's not a problem, right? Okay. <laughs> Uh, but then as soon as he did, as soon as he did, uh, when I go into a running race now anywhere in New Jersey, there is always someone there who is running the entire race in a four-minute mile pace. It's belief. So as part of our ongoing continuous spiritual work, to get clear, to get better and better at dealing with the stuff in our lives. We want to build that belief. There's a way, it's possible, um, there is a solution, and all I have to do is stick with it. Let me just stick with it. Now, coincidentally, past, uh, a couple of weeks ago, I took a special online declutter course workshop that the the leader of it promised us who are participating it was free so she promised us to choose a hot spot a hot spot is a place where you you put stuff down and no matter how many times you clear off the hot spot when you turn around and look at it again it's filled with stuff again Right? Does everybody have a, knows what a hot spot is, right? It's like if you enter the house, there might be a table and you put all your stuff on it and um, or a kitchen table is really good where, you know, there's the stuff that you need there and then all this other stuff. And I remember years ago, uh, there was some sort of hurricane that was hitting Long Island. I lived on Long Island at the time and I, I went, I came to New Jersey to my mom's house to weather the hurricane and we took a hold of one of her spots, this three-tiered little beautiful little table, and we cleared it all off. We took every little object off. We put it all away somewhere. I remember dusting the three tiers, how beautiful it was. It was just lovely. And then on, at Thanksgiving, I returned to my mother's house, and it looked like that had never happened, complete with the dust. I was like, what the heck? It was different stuff, but it was all there. It's a hot spot, right? So this woman said, if you follow this process I'm going to give you, you will clear off your hot spot and it will never be a hot spot again. So I followed her process and she's right. So now you all want to know, right? What's the hot spot? Forget about the problem. I want to know how to get rid of my hot spots. Well, it's this, I realized as I was sitting over here, it's the same approach to handling a difficulty or a problem. So I want you to imagine your problem as this messy hot spot, just filled with all these different objects and flotsam and jetsam, just strewn there willy-nilly. And all you know is you look at it and it just seems huge. Right. So 
that's our problems, our difficulties. It's something out there that feels so overwhelming that we, that like when we first approach it, it feels like I can't handle it, right? And so the first step, actually the first step is to pick a hotspot. So I asked you all to pick a problem, pick, pick one. Because I had issues when she first started, you know, I mean, she gave her first talk on Facebook Live and, you know, here's the process and I'm ch in the chat. I don't get it. I don't understand. I don't know what to do. And, and so she chatted with me. She said, okay, can I lead you through the process through chat? I said, yes. She's like, okay, step number one, pick a hotspot. And my answer was, I have six hotspots. And her answer was, pick one. So pick one. You're going to give it your full attention. In a half an hour, I was able to chat back, okay, I picked one. It took me a half an hour. Pick one. Now, what I want you to do is one by one, take everything in that hotspot, in that problem, and take it out one by one and make piles. So, example, I, a, couple of, a couple of weeks ago, I had a problem with a person in one of my classes who behaved in a way I thought was inappropriate and harmful. So, let's make that my example. So, what's in that hot spot? What's in that problem? First of all, that's, there's that person. So, let's take that person and make a pile of that person. And then there is the behavior that that person engaged. So that's different than the person, okay? But it's still there in that hotspot. So let me take the behavior and make a different pile of that. And then there were the other people in the room. And let's take them all out of the problem. Observers, teacher, authority figures, lay them all out. Now I got, my living room was, you know, so, you know, completely filled with the objects, but there's all that, okay? So, so we've got all, so my first things that I had to take off my problem were all these people and their behavior. So there was, so let's put all the behaviors of other people into one spot because there was the behavior that what I didn't like and then there was the behavior of the, the authority figure, which was did nothing about it. So that behavior, put that in the pile. And then there, there might be um, some physical things that have to do with it. Maybe your problem um, has to do with um, a physical ailment or something. So take the physical ailment off and make it a pile. Maybe there are resources or situations. It's a closed room. It's tight. There's not a lot of room. That's part of the problem. Let's pull it out. There's the age of all the people involved. That's part of the problem. So what are all of the contributing external factors to your problem? Take them all off and just see what you've got. And so if you've got all that off, you may notice you've got still a hunk of junk there. And what you've got now left is your opinions, your emotions, your beliefs, and maybe your behavior. And so I want you to examine those things. First of all, I was upset. I was angry. Something should be done. So I was angry. I was upset. That's part of my problem. So let's set that aside. And then there were the beliefs. First of all, I, oh, there was also fear. I was afraid that that one person's behavior might hurt someone else. And so that fear that someone might get hurt is in me, set that aside. And then I had the thought, 
well, something horrible really could happen and other people might start making choices that could become unpleasant experience for me. So my fear of what other people might do is me, but that has to come off the table. So I have that, that belief about what, or fear of what other people might do. I've got that opinion of what other people are doing or not doing. So, so when, what you could see as what a simple little thing, which is someone did something that I didn't like, it's over and done with, it's a past, but I was carrying this mound of a hot spot with me for a couple of weeks. And I was going over and over and over it in my mind because some every what at the as I pull all those thoughts out, what the big heavy object that was in the middle of it was something in me that felt like something needs to be done. And do I need to do it? Is it mine to do? And that was my problem. So the problem actually wasn't the behavior of the student. That's all been there, done that, gone. The problem was I didn't know what to do. But it wouldn't let me go. Something had to be done. And I tried to think about it. Well, it's for the teacher to do it. But the teacher wasn't doing anything. So it was for me to do or not. I don't know. So for me, when I unpack the hot spot, it's all laying around. So now what was there, what you're going for is an empty table. And everything is now strewn all over around you so that you can see all the elements that were there. And that what part you are in the center, because now you decide what goes back there. So you have a problem and you've pulled out all the pieces and now the solution is a new arrangement of what you put back there in that spot. So what needs to go back there? For me, what does need to go back there are all the people. It's a class. Those people, apparently I have no control at making sure all the people leave or that one little kid leave. I mean, that's put, them, put all the people back there and put the purpose of the class back there and don't put maybe the, the, the resources and the things, whatever, put that there, but don't put back your feelings, your beliefs, your worries, your emotions, your opinions. Let all that stay off your problem. And now, before you put it back, right? So you're, you're getting ready to put it back. Now we do what Norman Vincent Peale says, which is, let's get still. We know that still small voice, we get still. We wait for the guidance. We don't decide what goes back. We have an idea of what goes back, but we're looking for a solution, some new element to enter in. And sometimes the solution can happen just because we've unpacked it. And like me, I can say, wait, the whole problem is me. I need to do, I have to, something to do and I don't know what to do. Okay, so what do I do? Let me do spiritual work to, to heal me, whatever. But there's still, what action will take place? The solution still isn't there. So we want it after we've pulled it all out, we call on, on that loving presence within to be with us, to, to invite that still small voice to show us the way. And here's where I think it's good to have patience and, and be persistent, to let all the stuff Stay all around your living room floor for a while. That's actually what you're supposed to do with the hotspot. You let it all sit there because you're not there to put it all away. You're there to solve 
what was the glue that caused all this stuff to be glommed there to begin with? That's in dealing with the hot spot. What we're and a problem. What we're looking for is clarity. So it's not just that it's all there, but what's holding it all there? What's the what's the element? that's the glue that's keeping it all stuck together. And obviously, if you're like me, right, it's, it's you, it's, it's yourself, but what about yourself? What about yourself? And so we call on divine love. I like calling on divine love to show me the way. Divine love, show me the way. Because as I unpack that particular problem, and probably every problem or difficulty that anybody has, love is always the answer. But not human love, but as in love, show me, show me the way. In other words, what my hotspot expert told us to do is to think about who you are in the equation and accept who you are. So as I looked at my first hot spot in my, in my entrance way, and I pulled everything all out, asking, okay, what, what really goes here? Or what matters in your heart about this? And as I sorted through my, first of all, my, my clutter area, as I sorted through it, I realized, okay, I need a place to put my purse down on when I first enter the house, that's its place. And I put a basket there, that's for all the library books that I take out and are overdue. And there's a lot of them. <laughs> but I have a place for them, they're not lost all over the place, they're there. And everything else that was there doesn't belong there. I found, I put some pla things in other places, threw out a lot of stuff, and there still remains there on my living room floor uh, things I haven't yet decided what to do with, but they don't go there. They don't go there. And so as I think about my problem with my uh, behavior person issue, I realize that what needs to be there in that classroom is love and that we all are there for love. And even, even that one person who behaved inappropriately needs love. And that, that, it, that the lack of love might have actually been the cause of that behavior. But, you know, I can't analyze all that. I don't know, and I'm not a therapist. But I do know that love needs to be there. That love is, is bringing us together and what I want to experience more of. And so now I know what does belong there and what doesn't belong there. My judgments of how the other people are behaving and something's gotta be done and I can't do it and uh, all that stuff doesn't need to be there. And I don't have to put it back there if I realize I can put love there. I can put love into the middle of that. Any spiritual truth that rings your own guts that you, that you like, yeah, I like that, that thought, there is a way, or God does not disappoint us, or um, there is a solution, there is an answer, or um, he, he says um, in here, um, well, I have to, this is another whole thing, but I can do it, I can solve it. Um, put that in that spot that's now got some space around it. And then you hold on to it. It doesn't have to be solved right away. One of the things about problems, right, is we want to solve them right away, right? We always feel like, I, gotta, I need an answer now. I got to do it right now. And what you want to realize is chances are, no, that's just because you don't like how you're feeling. But the situation can simmer for a little while. So you have time to step back and get clear and sort through it. You have time before you respond. 
before you send back that email. You have time to let it simmer until you get some guidance as to the next step for you. And so coming up with the spiritual truth can be the light that shows you there is a way. And so it's up to us to figure out what is the spiritual truth that needs to be in this place. I mean, maybe with Roger, with Roger Bannister, it was probably his coach who thought, he can run short, faster than a four-minute mile. How can I arrange it so that he does? <laughs> okay, well, you know, he did what he did. Um, but, there, but there is a divine answer. And one of the things we want to realize is our brain, right, is organized on, on three different functional levels. We've got our conscious mind, which is the one that's always wrestling with our problem when we find ourselves stuck, right? It's going around and around and around and around and around, and we're thinking it over and over and over again, and we, we keep getting all these dead ends because it's this mound of stuff, and we're, we, we, we're trying to sort through it. But what we just did right now in our exercises, we kind of sorted through it with some sort of intention. Like, let me just, see, let me not solve the problem. Let me just see what I've got to see what is the problem here. Because before, with my situation, it was like, what's the problem? Well, it's her, the kid, and then it's the teacher, and then it's that one, and then it's this one, and it's me, and it's all over the place, and, you know, and ultimately everybody's going to quit, and economic decline, and I'm going to suffer, and, you know, whatever. And so one of the things we need to realize that we do, if we do it, which Norman Vincent Peale points out, is... One of the great things that positive thinking does for people is that it teaches them to stop working against themselves. So many people actually practice self-defeat. By their thoughts, they actually convince themselves that they cannot handle their difficulty. They are defeated in their minds. And so he... he, he says what a mantra that you can say he says i hope you never forget it you can say i never build a case against myself so along one of the ways i experience problems is i've got the issue i've got all of my beliefs and my fears on my emotions around it and then i've got a dialogue going on about how I can't handle it. And I'm arguing against anything in me that would try to say, yeah, you can handle it or you gotta handle it. And so the thing is, is that it's the argument that you want to derail, that part of you that says, I can't handle it, and then the other part of your mind that's saying, well, you're, you're going to have to handle it. You've got to handle it. That can't be, that argument cannot be resolved. I can't handle it, but you got to handle it. <laughs> no. What you want to stop is the argument. Because that's there on that hot spot too. And so we want to take off the argument and just stop it. As in, no, make no determination of what you are or are not able to do. Just let that be. Because you don't know what the solution is yet. You don't know what the divine is going to guide you to do yet. You don't know how it's going to be handled. You don't know anything. You don't know anything yet. And so let yourself just be there. And in that still small voice, now, right? Okay, it's an, Norman Vincent Peale has a very direct relationship with God. So he, he, he said something like, God, help me. I don't know what to do. I know that love belongs here. I know that there is a way. I know that there is an answer. I know that I am being given this situation so that I can grow and become more. Whatever it is that you you know is on the table here. 
So I know that, but help. I don't know what to do. And to just let that be. He says to drop your problem. Let me see how it works. It's a practice that he experienced at a Quaker meeting. So during a Quaker meeting, apparently very little is said. And in the setup, um, they read two scriptural passages before they went into their practice of silence, which is what they do at a meeting. And so the passages were, be still and know that I am God. In quietness and in confidence shall be your strength. And when he attended, he said, a man said before the silent period began, if anyone here has a problem, drop it now into the deep pool of spiritual quietness. And so I invite you now, whatever it is that you've got, have chosen, is to take the whole thing and drop it. In fact, it means don't hold it anymore. Drop it into that great pool of spiritual silence. And let it be. As I've practiced dealing with problems as challenges and listening to that still small voice, I notice more that there is enough time to be still and not act. Almost always. I would say maybe for me, maybe 95% of my issues, I have time to not act and to just let it be. Let it simmer. And in that simmering time, every time I've had that simmering time, I've noticed that somehow either a new idea rises up in me or something else happens and the problem got solved without me, which is what happened with my particular experience of a couple of weeks ago. When I went into class this past week, I noticed the teachers having a conversation in the back room. And I was what? I wonder if they're talking about that. And then the, no indication that they were but then afterwards, I saw one of the teachers jokingly mimic the behavior that I saw in class. They had noticed it. They, were, they, have, a, they have a plan developed for how to handle it. That's what I saw. I didn't have to do anything more. I'm so grateful. I'm so grateful. Sometimes I, I made a mistake at the beginning of this year. Uh, I told, gave somebody wrong information. When I realized it a couple of months later, I had, it, talk about, uh-oh, it was like, oh my gosh, I made a bit, this is a big one. And immediately I, I thought, okay, let's deal with it. What do we have here? took all the pieces off of the hotspot. I sent an email communication, which was wrong. That communication was spread throughout a community that was impacted by that information. And I now have to let them know that it, the happy thing that they thought was going to happen is not going to happen. It's my mistake. I, I pulled out, how did I make this mistake? Because you don't, you know, whatever, but let's not, we got to deal with that because what was it in my process that made 
me make that mistake. And I've worked that out, but that's a detail for another time. And right now I've got this in front of me. And so I immediately communicated with the, that community of people. I'm sorry, I made a mistake. This is going to happen instead of what I told you what's gonna happen and waited for the response, which wasn't a good one. They were very, very upset. And then I thought, okay, I'm representing a foundation here. I need to let the foundation know I made this mistake because it's their reputation that's on the line. So I, I communicated to the other board members on the foundation. I made this mistake, totally did it myself. If you think it's whatever you think is best for me to do for the foundation's good, I will do, even if it is resign. Um, that's okay. I, whatever, whatever it costs. And as things all turned out, the foundation is like, um, they decided it's, it is what it is. It's fine. You know, they want me more than, and they actually, you know, supported me in quote, you made the mistake, but I'm like, you need to be aware because if I keep making more mistakes like this, maybe you better need to be making another decision about giving me responsibility because, you know, I don't know what that was about. Um, I know what it was about. I was rushed. So I tried to get something done, made a mistake. So yeah, that was a problem. And, but again, because I unpacked it and I said, okay, what would make this problem be really horrible to me would have been some of my old false beliefs. The belief that I have to be perfect. The belief that everybody has to like me. The belief that I'm here to please other people. The belief that I'm not allowed to make a mistake the belief that everybody's gonna be angry with me, um, the belief that I'm going to be humiliated, all that I've had in the past. And with this one, very little of that was there. So I was able to just see what was there. I made a mess, I need to fix it as I can and be held accountable, fess up, Whatever the consequences are, out of my hands, let the greatest good be done. And whatever it was, it all got worked out. And I'm not feeling guilty about it. And I don't have those people on my mind and how awful they must felt. In fact, I thought, wait a minute. You know, they did get some good. <laughs> so it's not like, whatever. Um, but also, I'm allowed to make a mistake and not feel guilty the rest of my life about it. And I'm sorry. And I did spiritual work for them and I did a treatment for them that they are fully supplied and that it doesn't have to be through me or through my foundation that they receive their good. They're fully supplied. And in fact, I did an Emma, Curtis Hopkins. This too is good. This too is God. This too is for each one of them. And I demand that they see the blessing in this. I did what I could, but I, I couldn't give them what wasn't mine to give. I know many of you have children or pets, right? You do your best, right? It's not your fault if they end up all screwed up, right? Which they do, don't they? <laughs> you gave them your best, right? You gave them life expression in a bodily form, but you know, and you did your best. But unpacking all that stuff and seeing what it is, you see clearly, okay, you've stripped the issue from all that baggage that you have. And there may be baggage that you need to do spiritual work on to heal. Fine. And then there's the actual situation and what needs to be done. The divine will show you the way of what to do in the actual situation. And when you're ready to deal with all that baggage that's now laying in the middle of my living room floor, the divine is there to help you sort through all that and find a perfect place or to heal it so that it goes back, probably a lot of that stuff I have in the middle of my living floor should all be tossed out in the garbage, which is all that emotional 
baggage and false beliefs that we add to a problem. It should be tossed out in the garbage. The need to please other people, the need to make sure everybody likes you, the need to make sure everybody is always happy around you, the, the need to always be right, to always be good, to always be perfect, to throw it all out. And then we do have Raymond Charles Barker, one last thing, okay? If you still got your problem, anybody still have their problem in simmering? Okay, Raymond Charles Barker. The Power of Decision, page 16, how to do it. Take one problem that you want to solve. Make certain that you really want to be rid of it. Say aloud, I want to be rid of it. Say aloud, I want, I want to, to be, be rid, rid of it. it. Declare that this decision is final and irrevocable. This decision is final and irrevocable. Mentally picture yourself as no longer having the problem. <sighs> I'm free. And then go and think about something else. Now he says, every time you begin to rethink the problem, stop and shift your attention to the fact that it no longer exists in your world. Never worry about it again, or you will, will be reclaiming it, reactivating it. Always, your momentary consideration of it must be, it has gone and can never return. What I like to think is, if it comes back to me, is it's being taken care of. It's being taken care of. It's being taken care of, okay? And now we're going to do Raymond Charles Barker's treatment to seal the deal. So this is what it, you're all ready? Okay. So take a moment, go within. And this word that I'm speaking in the first person is you talking to your subconscious mind. My subconscious mind is a function of the universal mind. It obeys my word and acts upon it. I have declared the dissolution of this condition. I now reaffirm my decision. I no longer want, need, nor have this negative situation. It has gone into nothingness. It no longer has power over me. I recall it to mind no more. I am free. Praise God, I am free. Indwelling mind, you have now given me my freedom from it. And so it is. I shall say no more. Reverend Rich, take away. Mm -hmm. Christopher Robin and I walk along with branches lit up by the moon. Posing our questions so out in the air, so our days disappear far too soon. There's some problems, but I've wandered much further than today than I should, and I can't seem to find my way back to the wood road. Thank you. 
get a honey jar off the nose of a bear. So this word is being spoken for each one. One mind, the infinite mind of God, knows all. It knows each one completely and thoroughly. It knows each and every situation. It knows a way to resolve everything for the highest and greatest good of all. This infinite mind that is knowing it is now knowing it at that point of conscious awareness, which is the conscious thought of each one. Each one has the answer, knows the solution, knows the next step, knows that inner guidance. And all is well. I am grateful this is the truth. I release this word to God's law. Grateful it's done. And we agree by saying, and so it is. All right, that's the way it is. Well, we have a, a full capacity crowd here um, at the Masonic. We're ready to celebrate. And for those of you who are home, you are there with our hearts. So glad that you came. And we are done. Reverend Rich, not too many the here. Spaces left, right? No, not too many. I said, Amen. 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 for being here. I don't know who's left, but I've got to say goodbye now. Time for refreshments, and hopefully some of you might be able to join us in the coming Sundays. So we are here in person live, and we will stay on Facebook live too. So you'll be able to join us one way or the other. Okay, enough said. Bye-bye. Goodbye. Goodbye.